Welcome to today's program, Anatomy of a Restricted Covenant. Copies of the slides, a link to the recording, and the CLE verification form will be emailed to you in the days following the webinar. During the program, a CLE code will be read aloud and you will be required to include this code on the CLE form. Throughout the webinar, please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box on your screen. Now I'd like to turn it over to Kate Pirelli. Good afternoon and good morning, depending upon where you are. Uh, we're delighted to be with you today for this webinar. Um, I'm Kate Pirelli. Uh, I'm a partner in the Boston office. I'm the co-lead of Cypher Shaw's uh, National uh, Trade Secret and Restrictive Covenant Practice. Uh, this practice, actually, we just got some great news, but moments before this breaking news before the webinar that we were just named as a uh, for the seventh consecutive year as a tier one firm in this practice area by Legal 500. So we're, we're all gonna celebrate after this webinar. Um, my own practice is uh, focuses on a uh, national practice on advising employers on protection of their confidential information, trade secrets, and, and which includes the use of restrictive covenants, which is what we're gonna be talking about today. Helping uh, companies implement those across jurisdictions, multi-jurisdictional, some, some employers across 50, 50 jurisdictions. And I litigate those cases across the country too, both prosecuting enforcement and defending against enforcement of restrictive covenants. Also with me today and part of our, pra our trade secret and practice group uh, uh, practice area is um, Robin Marsh, who's an associate in our Chicago office in the litigation group. She's admitted to the um, a host of federal district courts across the country. She's a member of the Northern District of Illinois trial bar and as such litigates cases nationwide. Her practice focuses uh, similarly on, on enforcement and defense of trade secret covenant litigation, often tied to misappropriation of trade secret claims with the remainder of her practice dealing with pre-litigation counseling, including drafting of restrictive covenants and handling matters with respect to other business torts and general commercial lit. Uh, <clears throat> Matt Simmons is senior counsel in our Houston office. Excuse me, I'm going to have my bit of a cold today, so I'll do my best not to lose my voice. <clears throat> Excuse me, Matt Simmons is senior counsel in Texas office, or Houston, Texas office. He's licensed to practice in Texas and Florida, along with a number of other uh, federal district courts. His practice also focuses on unfair competition uh, by acting as litigation counsel for plaintiff or defendants in restrictive covenant and trade secret misappropriation claims and disputes uh, and the remainder of Matt's practice focuses on employment defense. Um, so today uh, our, our goal is to give you a high level briefing on uh, our restrictive covenants agreements, which I'll refer to as RCAs, just to save some words and time. Um, you're likely familiar with the types, but we'll uh, start with just a level set on those types of agreements and then get into sort of best practices as you consider using uh, some medley of uh, these restrictive covenant agreements, um, if you're already using them, how to keep them up to date and how, how to make sure that you're keeping them up to date and uh, given all of the evol uh, evolution of changes in state law across the country and some federal law developments uh, also on the horizon. Um, it, it's, you know, no, no, it's not a one size fits all solution to protecting your confidential information and trade secret. We're going to try to uh, highlight some of the issues that come up in um, rolling these out, which to use and how best to, to get them enforced. Um, the audience today is a, is a nice mix of large uh, multi-jurisdictional employers, um, some regional employers and even some startups. We've got a nice mix of industries. Uh, and a nice mix of folks at those companies, both in-house lawyers, HR representatives, and then we have a, a nice uh, mix of outside counsel as well. So we hope our comments are helpful today. We'll have some opportunity to answer some questions, we hope, at the end. Um, if we don't, we'll certainly will get back to you with the information after the program. But this is the agenda for the day. I'll start with the types of restrictive covenants and factors that will influence whether they will be enforced. Um, we'll move on with Matt to number two here with uh, key issue spotting tools and ramifications of, of uh, when the, uh, an RCA is not enforced or when you seek to enforce it and it's not enforced by a court. And then Robin will uh, talk about drafting and implementing new restrictive covenants. I'll wrap up with just some key takeaways and summaries and we'll take your questions if we have some time. And as I said, if we don't, we'll We'll, we'll get back to you with some uh, answers to those questions after the program. 
Let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> uh, and next one. So um, again, just an, a quick overview. That's why we call it 101. You all know these, I'm sure. Uh, these are the common types of post-employment restrictive covenants uh, in no particular order, but non-disclosure uh, and confidentiality agreements, uh, uh, which just protect and, and delineate the types of information that's confidential or proprietary or even trade secret uh, qualified. Um, very common across uh, all levels of employees, obviously, and we'll talk some more about that as we go on. Non-competition, um, probably the most uh, uh, talked about and debated these days. Um, uh, we'll talk a little bit about those and, and um, some of the tips on uh, enforcing those and rolling them out. And then finally, non-solicit, non-recruitment, and no service agreements, which cover the uh, non-solicit of business, particular business from customers or particular clients or even a particular uh, industry or business. And then, of course, uh, uh, non-recruitment of employees. Um, the standard uh, medley, as I said, of, of post-employment restrictive covenants. Can you go to the next slide, please? So, um, you know, the enforceability of these covenants is, is very, very uh, much driven by state law and in some instances, even local ordinances. Um, it, they're very fa uh, fact driven. Uh, um, and each case is a little bit different depending upon the type of employee uh, involved, the role, the type of restrictive covenant at issue, of course. But in general, and very much at a high level, States are enforcing restrictive covenants that require um, uh, will require the following that the restriction be supported by adequate consideration. Um, in, in the case of uh, a new employee joining a company that is uh, taking the job and having having employment, that's typically the consideration. And in the midst of employment, of course, it's it's most states require. Uh, something more than just continued employment. That is clearly the trend across the country. It requires something else, whether it's access to additional confidential information and trade secrets, or whether it's a spot bonus, a raise, um, or some, some change in the person's um, monetary uh, compensation and benefits. Um, <clears throat> additionally, the, the restrictions need to be narrowly tailored to protect legitimate business interests. Another acronym you'll hear us state, or at least all state, is LBIs, legitimate business interests, and those, those typically are protection of confidential information, protection of trade secrets, or protection of customer goodwill. Um, and then, uh, you know, all these limitations, all the courts are talking about them always talk about reasonableness and balancing um, an employee's right to get a new job and have mobility in their employment versus protecting the, the LBIs that I've just referenced. Um, and then the common limitations that apply uh, to these types of agreements, um, both, both, both non-competes and non-solicits uh, focus on time limitations, uh, you know, anywhere from six months to a year to two years and beyond. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that in the context of non-competes and what is uh, acceptable these days and sort of the trends across the country. Um, the activity that's being restricted, and I mentioned earlier, whether you the employee can't solicit customers or potential customers um, or employees or engaging in a particular competitive activity, going to a competitor. And then geographic and customer restrictions, um, not competing within a certain geographic space we're not, not competing uh, perhaps in, uh, in the range of certain customers in, in place of a geographical limitation. Um, you know, they're, they're, as I said, these are driven by state uh, common law as well as uh, state statutes. There's 47 states across the country right now that actually permit non-competes. There's a lot of chatter across uh, all the jurisdictions, both state and now on a federal level about the banning non-competes, but as of today, 47 states allow them uh, with a number of, um, you know, modifications on what you can and can't do, which we'll talk a little bit about today. Uh, and only three states don't allow them. That's California, North Dakota, and Oklahoma. And Washington, D.C. has a bill pending that I don't think is quite yet effective that would also ban them. <clears throat> um, over the past several years, Numerous bills to modify state common law uh, 
uh, non compete obligations as well as non solicit. There's even a little bit of chatter now about non disclosure agreements on a state level and what what's acceptable there. Um, last year alone, 66 bills uh, were introduced to modify non competes statutes across the company uh, across the country rather, and even more this year and the year is uh, not yet complete. And the focus on statutory reform and, and modification and uh, reform of common law is focused primarily uh, on lower wage workers and non-exempt employees. So employees that are either hourly or below a certain salary level. And in some states, that salary level is as high as $100,000. Um, folks in that ca uh, category, the employers in those states are not allowed to ask uh, those employees to sign on to non-competes. Other notions that are being implemented across state lines now uh, in terms of reform to the common law uh, and as well as existing statutes on non-competes are notice provisions or so-called fairness prov prov uh, provisions, giving the employee some advance notice before the non-compete becomes effective, whether if it's a new employee, some states like Massachusetts, where I sit, um, is asking is requiring 10 days in advance. Uh, uh, and for current employees, uh, 10 days uh, before the effective date of the agreement. Um, and in Massachusetts, and this is true in some other states as well, if that is not written into the agreement, the non-compete agreement, the agreement will not be enforceable. Um, so some very um, other, another fairness notion that's being implemented is right to counsel that agreements have to state that the employee has a right to counsel and a right to talk with counsel about the non-compete before they sign. Another um, fairness provision that's being implemented in many state statutes uh, are venue provisions. Um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about those as we get further into the program. So lots going on on the state level, uh, mostly on the non-compete um, uh, covenant, but but even some on non solicit and as I mentioned on uh, non disclosure, we certainly can't get into all of those today. Our goal is just to give you some high level points and things to think about as you as you start to think about these across your um, your workforce. Let's go to the next slide. So, as I mentioned, um, <clears throat> you know, traditionally, this has been a state law issue, whether restrictive covenants and non competes specifically can be enforced. Um, and it, but starting in 2015, it started to spill over on the federal level, those concerns and questions about them. Um, the first came up in Congress in 2015, it then, um, then went over to the Senate. Uh, then in 2019, the Federal Trade Commission started to look at uh, non-competes and other, any other type of agreement that would restrict competition. Um, the Obama administration studied it very closely. They brought in, um, you know, uh, economists and experts in the field to come up with recommendations to the Obama administration uh, and then the Biden administration is doing the same and, and uh, as noted here on this slide. I'm not going to go over all of this. You, you probably have read about and heard about what he what was released in July of 2021, which was a, um, a very, very comprehensive executive order that went through encouraging the FTC to consider um, rulemaking in this area. And that's underway. There's lots of things and lots of moving parts there. I understand a, a new commissioner was just recently appointed. There's three commissioners that are looking at this and, and the, the, the voting was, was up in the air on how things might go. A new commissioner was just brought in. Um, and, and some people are speculating that that uh, new commissioner will, will break the tie, so to speak, towards um, some type of uh, legislation or FTC rulemaking, I should say. Um, so I'm not going to go over all of these, but this is the more recent stuff that's going on on the federal level. Can you go to the next slide, please? Um, just recently last year, uh, the DO uh, Department of Justice, as well as the Federal T T Trade Commission, set up a virtual public workshop to discuss um, the efforts to promote competitive labor markets and worker mobility. Lots of focus on non-competes. Um, similarly, in March of, of this year, uh, Department of Treasury um, issued the State of Labor Competition Report. Again, a weighty document, but um, stating that its purpose is to summarize the prevalence and impact of uncompetitive firm behavior in labor markets, uh, including the use of non-compete agreements and, and no poach agreements. Um, so, all kinds of focus on this area and um, it is a bit of a minefield these days, and, and that's one of the things we, we'd like to convey today is that there, there are lots of twists and turns, and it's important to stay up to date on not only state requirements, but to keep an eye on the federal uh, 
federal laws and what might change. Most of those laws would be prospective on a federal level. If anything does come into play, um, that would be our, our guess. That's typically the way it would work. So it wouldn't impact current agreements, but it would certainly govern what's going, going forward. So I think what we, you know, we, we thought might be kind of fun, and we'll see how this goes. We're going to do some uh, polling of the audience. We're going to do a few scenarios to, to raise some issues. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Raise some issues uh, around the language of restrictive covenants and what may or may not be enforceable and what in influences that type of decision. Um, so I, I'm going to, I hate reading, but I'll, I'll sort of highlight this slide and take a look, and, and you're going to be asked whether... Uh, the particular clause you're seeing is enforceable, yes, no, or maybe. Um, and we'll see what everybody thinks, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the slide. So the first one is, is this non-competition clause enforceable? And it provides for, uh, uh, for a period of two years commencing after the employee, employee separation date. Employee agrees that uh, he, sh he or she shall not directly or indirectly engage in any competitive activity. And competitive activity is defined as um, performing the same or similar work as the employee performed on behalf of the company any time during the last 12 months of employment with the company um, in, a, in the prohibited territory. That's defined as any, any state in which the employee on behalf of the company at any time during the last 12 months of employment did business in the United States. So what do you think? Let's uh, let's hear from the audience. We've got, I think, something like three or four hundred people, as I understand, at least signed up. Um, do you think this is enforceable? We'll give a moment to uh, to get folks to respond. So it looks like um, the the per preponderance or majority of uh, votes, just over fifty fifty two percent, is at maybe. And I think that's the right answer. <laughs> so if you can go to the next slide. So why is it maybe? Um, that's correct. It, it's going to depend on the state you're trying to enforce it in. Uh, and, you know, if we just look at a few states here, Texas, um, um, a two-year non-compete is generally enforceable. That's pretty unusual these days. It's getting more and more uh, difficult, I think, to enforce two-year non-competes. In Utah, uh, if you're if you have operations in Utah, non-compete if a non-compete was executed after May 10th, 2016, it would be void um, if it was this if it was over uh, one year. And in, in a case where an employer there's a bit of a penalty, the employer seeks to enforce a post post employment non-compete um, that's over a year, it's unenforceable, and the employer will be liable for the employee's costs associated with the arbitration or trial. Uh, attorney's fees and court costs and actual damages. So there's some real teeth to not following that statute. Um, in Louisiana, um, it would not be enforceable. It's fairly good language in terms of being narrowly tailored, but in Louisiana, Louisiana no, because there's a requirement under Louisiana law um, to list the specific parishes uh, within the particular employee's uh, scope of, of, of their employment. So any non-compete in Louisiana would have an addendum with all of the particular parishes that, that um, are impacted by that person's employment. Um, California, Oklahoma, North Dakota, as I mentioned, um, the answer would be a big no. Um, so it's, it's very much because um, they prohibit uh, non-competes. So you can see it's, it's a very much state-specific uh, discussion. Let's go to the next one. So it's a little bit different. It's another non-compete clause. It's a period of one year after the employment relationship ends. The employee agrees uh, to not directly or indirectly compete against the company in its business as defined below within the prohibited territory as defined below. And business means any business related to the provision of audio and video solutions in commercial environments. The prohibit prohibited territory means Harris and Fort Bend County, Texas, and within 50 miles of any company office in the state of Texas. So obviously this is a, a Texas non-compete, uh, obviously. So what do you think? Is it enforceable? Let's hear from you. Interesting. So 
52% of folks who have responded, thank you for, thank you all for participating in this fund, um, said yes. 18% um, said maybe and 30% said no. So let's turn to the next slide on the answers. So it's likely no. Um, and this is what's known uh, as the janitor rule. It's a very broad um, prescription, uh, as you can see. And the geography as well might be overly broad. Let's go back to the, the actual provision. Go back a slide, please. Yeah. So any business related to the provision of audio and video solutions in commercial environments, it's wildly broad. Doesn't talk about the type of role, doesn't talk about what impact this particular employee had on on this uh, particular line of business. Uh, the only thing it, it, it includes is a geographic restriction. So it's what's known as the janitor rule. It's a pretty common mistake in drafting agreements is just being too broad. Um, and, and as you'll hear over and over again during this presentation, uh, you really the, these agreements need to be very narrowly tailored. And, and, and I, you know, what's the legitimate business interest here? What is the employer trying to protect? Is it a customer goodwill? Is a particular expertise of this particular employee? Employee? Is it trade secrets? Kind of hard to tell from this, but those are the types of things that would go into play. And it seems just from the description of the business that it wouldn't be tough to justify this in, in just about any jurisdiction. So let's go to the next one. <clears throat> so non solicitation. Uh, employee covenants and agrees that for a period of one year commencing on, on the employee's separation date, the employee shall not directly or indirectly influence or attempt to influence or solicit any employee or independent contractor of the company or any of its affiliates to restrict, reduce, sever, or otherwise alter the relationship with the company. Number two, solicit or induce, I'm paraphrasing, any person that is then a restricted customer of the company to cease being a client or customer. Or three, assist any other person in any way to do or attempt to do anything prohibited by any of the foregoing. And a restricted customer shall mean any customer of the company in the last um, <clears throat> two, 12 months. Enforceable? So we've got... Um, Pretty much uh, 48% say yes, it is enforceable. 18% uh, say no, and 33% say maybe. <clears throat> and the answer is likely. Next slide, please. Likely no. Um, even though this is a not a non compete and it's a non solicit clause, it also needs to be narrowly tailored. It's the same analysis that the courts will go through. Um, courts are a little less exacting with non-solicits, but still go through it, uh, an analysis of whether it's narrow, narrowly tailored. Obviously, with a non-compete, it's a, it's you're taking, you're keeping someone from a job, so it's a very exacting analysis. Um, but as I said, even even the courts will go through this. Here, it's a customer company-wide customer non-solicit. It's likely not enforceable as written unless the employee has access to all of the customer's confidential information. It may be enforceable, for example, against a C-suite uh, executive who would have this type of information. The underlined uh, parts here are provisions that you would want to add to a, a provision that you saw previously to bring it more towards the, the spectrum of enforceability. Someone <clears throat> with, who the employee had worked with or about whom the employee had access to confidential information. Um, further down, any customer of the company with whom the employee had contact or communications with in the last 12 months. I've seen some, some of these provisions add the world, uh, word material to contact to make it something much more than just a, a you know, one-time touch. Um, and anyway, it goes on there and talks about, uh, adds some, some more tailored rest uh, modifications or qualifications on the restrictions, and that's what, that's what courts are going to look, look for. So, um, it just shows you how exacting the drafting has to be, um, and many clients will, will initially ask, well, why, why wouldn't we just go broadly? And then a court can, can parse, parse away what is reasonable, what is not, but that's not always going to happen. Many states will not do that. Um, so, you have to start off with as narrow, narrow as a uh, provision as you possibly can. Let's go to the next slide. 
I want to think I'm going to hand it over. Um, we've talked about this. Next one. I'm going to turn it over Matt now to talk about um, some additional issue spotting and tools to ensure enforceability and what happens if it doesn't. Thanks, Kate. Hi, everyone. I'm Matt Simmons. Um, I'm talking about uh, issue spotting tools. So uh, when looking at your current non-compete or non-solicitation agreement, I want to provide you some tools to utilize um, and to think about whenever determining whether you need to update uh, your agreements uh, to make them more enforceable. Um, next section. Next slide. All right. So the first thing, the first issue that I always look at when looking um, at a current agreement uh, is what state law controls the restricted covenant. Um, you know, foreign selection clauses are enforceable, but in this area, there becomes a concern because a lot of the choice of law agreements that conflict with where the employee resides, uh, it would be against a fundamental right. So you could have an agreement that has a choice of law provision that generally is enforceable as to the rest of the agreement, but if it prohibits the employee from working or, or doing certain activities, it could be a violation of their fundamental right if the choice of law provision would net a different result than where than the state where the employee resides. Um, some states even you know prohibit or restrict the use of foreign form selection clauses or choice of law provisions. Examples: California, Washington, um, Louisiana, Massachusetts. Uh, and the, another thing that you have to consider nowadays is uh, remote workforce, alternative workforce agreements, uh, especially as it relates to salespeople. Uh, you know, I, I know that uh, I had a company recently whose head salesperson wanted to move to from Houston to Lake Charles, Louisiana. I, I guess they liked crawfish and casinos. Uh, who can blame them? Uh, but when looking at that, and looking at the non-compete agreement this is that this important salesperson had uh and you know they would commute back you know two days a month for team meetings but they would reside in louisiana well you have to update the non-compete to also include the specific parish names to make it enforceable in louisiana if there is a conflict of laws issue just as a cya um next slide All right, so here's a basic checklist. A lot of this stuff Kate touched on. Uh, the big things that you're looking for in your current agreements are this, consideration. So does it state it? So typically consideration is specialized training, provision of confidential information and goodwill. Uh, the timing can be from six months to five years. Everything is a sliding scale of reasonableness. So you make an agreement more or less enforceable by narrowly tailoring it or making it more overly broad. The next big thing that you look at is the scope of employment. And this is the janitor rule, right? So if your agreement prohibits your employee from being a janitor at a competitor, then likely it's unenforceable as written because it's overly broad. That's why it's called the janitor rule. Uh, look back periods. Uh, I've seen 12 months, 24 months and a look back period on you know, who the customer that they contacted or employee that they had confidential information about as it relates to non-solicitation provisions. So, you know, there, there's a gap there. Geography, there's a lot of different ways to cure the geography uh, requirement. So it can do state by state, it can do county by county, miles from company location. You can actually list specific co competitors that you don't want them to go to or a combination of all of them. As long as it's reasonable, then it will be enforceable, but the more narrowly tailored, the more enforceable it will be. Uh, so in Texas, two years, non-compete is generally enforceable. But if you do an internal analysis and you say, really all we need is 12 months or 18 months, then why not do a 12 month or 18 month non-compete? Because it'll be more enforceable because it's more narrowly tailored, even though you could get up to two years. Next slide. 
All right, issues three and four are really uh, looking at the position and the industry specific considerations. Um, you know, do you make everyone sign a non-compete uh, or only those that have access to confidential information uh, with the customers or no company trade secret processes? Uh, you know, I had, a, <laughs> I had a case early on in my career where a company sued a warehouse worker for a violation of a non-compete. The new company hired me to defend the warehouse worker and after a full day temporary injunction hearing, even though the judge held that the non-compete was enforceable, since the worker was a blue collar worker, didn't have any customer interface or access to confidential information, there was no consideration for the non-compete. So, you know, they lost. They lost the temporary injunction, they lost the case. And in addition to that, with gossip going around the company and the industry now people are like okay well this company uh, doesn't have enforceable non-compete agreements we can potentially go after their employees or their employees get wind of it and start setting up their own shops so there's adverse reactions um, to trying to get everyone under a non-compete agreement you really only need it for a specific portion of your workforce same thing for hourly, hourly versus salaried. Now, this is not a complete bar if you have an hourly employee with a non compete. Not at all. Okay. Uh, but it can be an equitable reason that courts look at. And some states actually take it into consideration in their statutes. So, for example, Nevada does not allow non competes for hourly employees. So, that's a consideration to take into account as well as it relates to the employee's position company specific stuff. Okay. So there's some really odd state specific exclusions and like hairdressers, uh, have a non-compete exclusion in, in certain states. Um, Utah has an exception for broadcasting industry. Hawaii has exceptions for information and technology sector. You know, a lot of states have exceptions for, uh, healthcare workers or physicians or attorneys. So knowing what type of business you're in is, is also important uh, to understand whether or not you can have a non-compete or the specific language in the non-compete. Um, type of business absolutely impacts the reasonableness. Let's say you're a hair salon. If your non-compete is 25 miles from your hair salon location, then and your customers only travel three miles to get a haircut, then that's an overly broad non-compete. If you're in the HVAC industry, however, a 25 mile non-compete is probably more narrow than you'd like it. So it matters what type of business you're in as it relates to the reasonableness of the restriction as well. Next slide. All right, the last one that I see a lot, uh, especially whenever companies don't update their non-competes on a regular basis or at least review case law, and uh, statutes on a regular basis is when the agreement was executed. Generally, changes in state law are not retroactive. Like, for example, in Utah, if the non compete was entered into after May 10th, 2016, if it was more than a year in length in the non compete, then it's void. Not voidable, just void. However, in Maryland, and some of the other states that are doing these uh, minimum threshold income uh, basis tests for whether a non-compete is enforceable or not, those are retroactive. So on September 30th, 2019, in Maryland, you could have a non-compete that's enforceable, but the next day on you know, October 1st, 2019, it's no longer enforceable uh, because the employee makes it less than $15 an hour. Um, what we've seen in some instances is employers looking at these new statutes and the effect on the workforce. I kind of liken it to how a lot of companies looked at the FLSA and, you know, the proposed changes to the highly compensated exemption. You know, okay, if I pay this employee an extra X dollars an hour or X dollars in salary, then I actually am able to get the benefit of a non-compete in this state. Um, you know, 
or somehow restructuring the employee salary, making it more base, less commission. You know, companies are doing that in response to these state statutes. And so that's something to consider as well. Uh, I would say most of these new state statutes and, you know, federal, uh, you know, potential action has really developed in the last five to seven years. Kate touched on a few federal issues as well that are coming up that we're anticipating in the near future. Um, so if, if you have non-competes that are older than seven years, I highly suggest that you review them, look at these, these tools, and see if you may need to revamp them. Next slide. All right, so there are also some consequences for not adhering to state restrictions. Some of the more extreme ones, Colorado, uh, it's a class two misdemeanor, punishable by up to 120 days in prison and or a fine of $750. Uh, Illinois is void and unenforceable. Um, Washington, $5,000 minimum in damages to employees plus attorney's fees and costs if a court reforms rural rights, modifies, or only partially enforces a knock fee. So uh, this goes to Kate's point. This isn't just, oh, I have an overbroad knock fee and I'll let the court reform it down. There are real tangible adverse actions that can happen to you if your non-compete that you sue on uh, is deemed uh, unenforceable as written. If it has to be reformed, if it has to be blue penciled, which is just taking out certain overly broad uh, sections. So, for example, if it has, you know, 10 states and you only, you know, it's only reasonable to have five states, you know, any types of those types of res reformations can lead to penalties. Next slide. In addition to, in addition to that, certain states uh, really have teeth to the fee sh shifting provisions. Uh, California, you know, attorney's fees, uh, Illinois, attorney's fees, if you try to enforce a non compete covenant, uh, Nevada, you know, damages, civil action, treble damages. There's a lot of things that the states are incorporating now, and it's becoming a trend to really force the company to look at their non competes, to look at their restrictive covenant agreements and ensure that they are narrowly tailored because the consequences are becoming more and more severe uh, based on the company and advantageous to the employee. Uh, next slide. I'll turn it over, Robin. Thanks, Matt. Um, the most important thing that I will be talking about today uh, next to the implementation of new restrictive covenants is the CLE code. And you will need this uh, for purposes of filling out the verification form that will be sent to you after the webinar. The code is SS9281. That is S as in CIFARS, S as in CIFARS, 9281. One more time, SS9281. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So in addition to all of the things that Kate and Matt have touched on, a lot of companies may have existing restrictive covenants for existing employees and are thinking about updating their existing non-competes to either have more teeth or have um, a little bit more uh, um, narrowly tailored language when it comes to addressing changes in the company say there's an acquisition or a divestiture, say the company has you know, doubled in growth, there is a need to have new restrictive covenants uh, as the company continues to uh, change its business. And that's fine because either these, as Matt said, stated, a lot of state laws or addition of state laws are just proactive or looking into the future, they're not retroactive and they don't affect existing agreements. So when you're considering drafting these new agreements, in addition to the you know, legitimate business interests and the narrow tailoring that you have to think about, you also have to contend with the many, many, many different state laws on this front and federal laws. So here are some things to consider. Where is your company's nucleus, the principal place of business? Where do most of your um, 
action items come from. Is your C-suite all located in one state? Is your C-suite across the country? What about your high-level executives, your salespeople, your other employees uh, to which these restrictive covenants will apply? Some companies are one state jurisdiction and that makes things a little bit cleaner and easier. It doesn't mean that there wouldn't be different levels of restrictive covenants for different levels of employees, but it means you just have one state law to contend with. If you are a company that has um, your headquarters based out of Illinois, but you manufacture your products out of uh, Michigan, and you have most of your sales force based in Ohio and Indiana, that's a lot of states that you have to deal with, and that's a lot of states that you have to contend with when you're considering drafting your agreement, not just from a choice of law venue at provision that you might put in, which companies, as Matt stated, under Atlantic Marine have a fundamental right to include. You also have to consider whether or not that would be enforceable in another state um, or against an employee in another state. And you have to consider what, how you can tie the interests of the location of your company versus the location of the employee for purposes of your restrictive covenant. So when you have employees across multiple jurisdictions, it's tricky. It doesn't mean it is the death knell for you to draft and prepare uh, appropriate restrictive covenants. It just means you need to have a fine tooth comb to make sure you're complying with state laws across the board, while at the same time protecting your company's interests, which is the bottom line. Um, as I mentioned, where and what are the company assets that need to be protected relative to the employee? Matt talked a little bit about geography. You may have a sales force in a certain state and you want to protect uh, the customer relationships in that state, but you might have training for that sales force relative to the product or service that is being sold in another state, which requires that employee to travel to that state all of the time and have um, interaction to that confidential or trade secret information in that state. You don't necessarily have to have geography as a state or a territory. You can use geography as um, a substitute for that would be customers or other types of trade secrets to make sure it's narrowly tailored and ensuring that you are adequately protecting those interests uh, as it relates to that employee's uh, interaction with that interest. Again, what levels of restrictive covenants are needed? If you assess your workforce, we talked previously about the janitor rule. Um, it's called that um, not pejoratively, but to say, you know, do you need to protect your interests all the way from the top to the CEO, all the way to the janitor that's, that's in the offices? And it's asking companies to take a hard look at what is a legitimate protectable interest, and you can't paint with the same broad brush across all level of employees. A lot of times we are asked to look at a company's uh, workforce and decide how best to protect their interests across the level of employees. For example, you might have a C-suite level of employees, and they have nationwide responsibility they have nationwide interaction with certain levels of the sales force, such that they have uh, interaction with other employees where non-solicited employees would be important. And obviously there would be non-disclosure obligations given the high level of information to which they are exposed. In those types of situations, we would maybe have a band, a banded level of different types of non, uh, excuse me, restrictive covenants that we could provide to you. We would think about saying, well, what are the highest level of protections we need for the highest level of your workforce? And then you might have a mid-level section of your workforce where perhaps maybe a non-compete is necessary, but for an abbreviated period of time, maybe six months, maybe three months, maybe just a garden leave, maybe um, not at all. And it may be more important to make sure that there is protection of customer relationships, vendor relationships, or uh, the stability of your workforce so that you have a non-solicit of customers and just a non-solicit of employees, leaving out the non-compete altogether. And then finally, for lower level employees that aren't necessarily client facing, 
or not necessarily in a position to have a, a pose a competitive threat to the company upon departure, it would maybe just be a non disclosure um, level agreement that would apply across the board for everybody to ensure that the company is adequately protecting the confidentiality and trade secret status of its information. And it's a really and again, not everybody necessarily needs an agreement. If there's somebody in HR, if there's somebody in accounting, if there is a receptionist, those individuals might not, um, would likely not be relevant people or appropriate people to have a non-compete uh, because I don't know that uh, you could really say with a straight face that these people pose a threat um, to divulging or using the company's protectable interests against them. And that's where the quote janitor rule comes in. Um, so we often assess that is, is my point and where it's important to consider what is needed when drafting these agreements. Further, what additional consideration is required, if any? Now these states are getting very savvy in terms of the types of restrictions that they are um, creating by virtue of statute, which we'll get to in a second, but uh, they are employee friendly and they want to say, if you want something, you gotta give something in return. And what is that? Well, different states have different rules and that's something to consider. If you're a new startup company, do you have the financial uh, um, bandwidth to be able to offer this type of consideration? And if not, that could be fatal to even coming out the gate and opening up these types of agreements for employees. Uh, so at the end of the day, when you're having these initial conversations internally and with counsel, you need to decide, well, what are the state laws that are implicated with respect to each of these answers and how do we go about preparing an agreement and hopefully not 10 agreements for 10 different states with 10 different exceptions that we can use and enforce in a seamless and uh, consistent manner. And that's obviously a challenge for many companies that operate in multiple jurisdictions. But one solution that we often turn to and offer is drafting a master template agreement at base that will always have a non-disclosure, uh, specifically for companies that do have uh, trade secrets at issue and that need uh, exceptional protection. And then depending on whether or not there are multi-level agreements for different levels of employees, that's something that can be separated out. But with, in addition to having your master template agreement, there are addenda to the ends that say, you know, address certain state laws. For example, we know from what Matt talked about is California does not allow choice of law agreements under the new, uh, excuse me, choice of law provisions under the new California Labor Go Code section 925. So, if you do have a choice of law provision in there saying, you know, I'm an Illinois based company, all cases have to be in a court of competent jurisdiction in Illinois, uh, and you have a California based employee at the end of your agreement, perhaps there would be an addenda saying, if you're a California employee, paragraph 12, choice of venue and choice of law provision does not apply to you. Um, you can do certain carve outs based on state laws that address little concerns to make sure that you have consistency and enforceability across the board. It is not a one size fits all approach as Kate said for your business. And uh, we work with you in understanding your industry, your business and how to best protect the company's interests and assets by virtue of making a narrowly tailored agreement uh, to also ensure free mobility of the workforce and, and, and competition. Can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, I am based in Illinois. So uh, one of the new things that came out in 2022 was Illinois enacted the Freedom to Work Act. And this has caused some consternation for some companies uh, that have existing agreements. But as a reminder, this is not retroactive. It only applies to agreements going forward after January of this year. As Kate prefaced, a lot of uh, states are enacting laws where there are income thresholds for any type of agreement or non-compete specifically to be 
uh, enforceable. So in Illinois, they did a $75,000 non-compete threshold and they, they accommodated that later on through 2027 and later for inflation and, you know, the number goes up and it's enlisted in the statute, but for at least the next six years, um, this, um, or excuse me, the next few years, that is the minimum threshold for non-competes. For non-solicits, uh, there has to be a minimum wage of $45,000 for employees. And they do have a carve out on certain employees for which non-competes and non-solicits cannot apply and those who are subject to collective bargaining agreements and those who are employed in construction unless those individuals are management, engineering, architecture, or design. Uh, and it lists out mainly high level types employees. So those are things to watch and consider because if you fail to meet those minimum thresholds as listed in the statute, as uh, Matt mentioned, their, your agreement can be thrown out, baby with the bathwater, automatically unenforceable and not even room for the court to consider blue penciling, consider changing it, which courts are loath to do anyway, but you wanna start off on the right foot and making sure you've met all your baseline uh, requirements before in rolling out agreements with your employees. This personal favorite at the end is adequate consideration. Uh, the legislature in all of its wisdom included uh, a requirement of adequate consideration, but uh, as a fun fact, decided not to define what adequate consideration means. So it, in the first part, it codified a Supreme Court case from several years ago known as Byfield and says the employee must work for the employer for at least two years after they sign the agreement or the employer provides adequate consideration in the form of some like continued employment plus additional financial benefits, or the employer provides adequate professional or financial benefits adequate on their own. Uh, the problem with this is what does that mean? Is that $100? Is that $5,000? Is that a promotion? Is that stock? Where does that leave us? The answer is we don't know. The law is relatively new. We haven't seen a lot of, uh, certainly not a lot of judicial interpretation of this yet, and it remains to be seen. Uh, I think it, the answer, the typical lawyer answer is it depends. It's going to depend on the level of the employee, the type of responsibility they have, and what really is enough financial consideration uh, to give it meaning and and be reasonable in a court of law. If you've got a C-suite executive and you're giving them a two-year non-compete and you offer them $100, that's probably not going to uh, stand the test of time. But if it's equity, um, you know, an extended, you know, a prestigious title and, you know, a signing bonus of $20,000, that has legs and that might be something that you can get behind and feel really good about if in the need to litigate that in a court of law. Um, next slide, please. Uh, as we previously touched on in, a side, in addition to Illinois, there are other states with specific issues of California being one of them that is a very employee friendly jurisdiction. Um, they, uh, address non-solicitation covenants with respect to uh, employees, <clears throat> employee non-solicits. As I mentioned, there's no choice of law uh, provision allowed in agreements uh, going forward under the new labor law, section 925. And overly broad confidentiality provisions can be considered de facto non-competes. Even though we love a non-disclosure agreement as a baseline, we need to be careful in states like California because if you say everything you touch is confidential, including you know the you know CPR and you know emergency fire codes that are on the inside kitchen cabinet, you're going to have a problem in California. Uh, next slide, please. So practical considerations for new non-competes. Do you have to roll out new non-competes for everybody or can you just do it for new employees? As we stated many times, state laws are not retroactive. Uh, you can usually keep them as is and just create new ones going forward, which uh, is usually the 
preferred course of action, but it depends, of course, on uh, how the company wants to deal with that and what other issues are they are contending with. Uh, you may, if you're not going to do that, you may have new employees. You may have employees that realize the existing agreements are unenforceable and may refuse to sign new agreements. So what, what will that mean for you in your workforce? Are you going to have workforce attrition because people don't want to sign these agreements? So if you are going to do a rollout, either for part of your workforce or all of your workforce, it should be controlled. It should be precise. There should be a plan in advance. Uh, you want to do a tiered rollout by employee, high level first as you go down the list of employees. You want to require all pages are returned and executed or initialed and maintain an appropriate file on that. I had a case many years ago where somebody just turned in the signature page. Couldn't we were able to tie it to the original agreement based on a document number in the lower left hand corner. But for that, I don't know that we could have because that employee tried saying, uh, uh no, I didn't sign a non compete and it was a huge issue in the litigation. You want to be able to have the terms and you want to have it all together as one in your records. Make sure there's sufficient time for review and notice based on state laws. If you do have to have consideration, you need to know whether or not you have the funding or the budget or the resources for that consideration. And you need to have a plan or at least the awareness of what to do when employees refuse to sign. You may have employees that leave and turn over and that's something you're gonna to have to contend with or at least have a plan for. Um, that's all from me. I'm gonna turn it over to Kate. Thank you for your time. Just one thing, in regards to additional consideration in states like Texas, it can be confidential information for new consideration for the new non-compete restricted covenant. I highly recommend uh, that you attach that confidential information as soon as the employee executes the agreement um, and even attach that uh, provision of confidential information to the back of the agreement in the employee's file. So do you have an actual record of you providing the confidential information to the employee as additional consideration? And it has to be new confidential information. Okay. Sure. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, Robin. Those are, that's great. Great comments. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. So we are running short on time as we always do. We talk too much typically. Uh, it's the nature of our, our trade. Um, but just to, um, I'm not going to go all these over these bullets, but we wanted to summarize sort of the checklist for you all to take away with you a uh, summary of some of the things we talked about. Um, I think it's clear even in the, the brief time we've had together that this landscape for non-competes particularly, but even for other restrictive um, covenants is changing every day and may change even more on the federal level. So you need to keep an eye on that best you can. Uh, hopefully you've got good counsel working with you either in-house or outside, or there's lots of good websites to, to check on updates. I'll tell you about one in a moment um, and others. Um, be strategic in what you're doing, both Matt and, and Robin have mentioned that. Follow the explicit statutory requirements and don't just default always to non-competes. Uh, it's not, it, you don't need them in every instance. Um, we recommend not using them for every single employee. It doesn't make sense unless you've got just incredibly high level employees that, you know, uh, that have access to every, every bit of confidential information that you um, possess, it just doesn't make sense. These other restrictive covenants can can cover a lot of the interests that you're trying to protect, as we've mentioned. Um, <clears throat> one thing we, we've kind of hinted at, but you know, you should be in a, a cadence with a review of these types of provisions, whether it's sometimes I think you know these days it should be every month given what's going on at the state level, but that's not practical. But you should do at least annual compliance reviews of what you have in place. Um, and have a system in, in place that you're tracking, as Robin said, who, who's got an agreement and what templates you're using and, and do they need to be updated. It, just have it part of your annual cycle to take a look at them to make sure they're up to date. <clears throat> it's good to do that sometimes around um, performance reviews or roll out uh, new salaries going into effect because that's when new consideration pieces are taking, uh, it would be at play for existing employees to, to get new agreements if you have to do it. So do this review in advance of those. So you want to roll out new agreements, you're at a good spot in the calendar year. 
And then <clears throat> we didn't talk much about this, but very, very important training on protection of confidential information, you, what your internal systems are, never mind from a safety, security, IT perspective, but training your employees how to handle uh, the confidential information and what is and what isn't, and the fact that they can't take it with them or disclose it, um, an annual training program covering those. And for particularly uh, sensitive trade secret assets, um, we recommend trade secret audits, that those can be incredibly complex or very simple going through with your in-house team um, and sometimes outside counsel to keep it privileged <clears throat> and a review, an audit of what you have and how you're protecting it, what holes there are and what you need to do to plug those holes. Um, efforts, those last two bullets, those two things, those types of things are very important when you go into court to try to enforce agreements. Court's going to say, what are you doing to protect your information beyond this one agreement, non-compete agreement? Are you protecting this stuff internally in addition to asking for these types of agreements? So just a few th uh, thoughts, a summary to take with you easily. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we uh, we have I uh, saw a couple of questions about what, whether we have a 50 state uh, reference and we do uh, uh, and here's a copy of it and you can request it be happy to provide it it's an incredibly um, helpful tool I I literally take it everywhere I go so that I have a quick reference when I'm talking with clients when I'm traveling um, it's it's fabulous and then we have a, a blog um, the, the the uh, address is there at the bottom and we address, you know, what's going on on a, a daily basis, basically new cases, new statutes, um, trends. Um, we're, it's a, we have prolific writers on this blog and there's, there are other good blogs out there. So take a look, poke around online. It's a good way to keep yourself up to date. Um, we are out of time. In fact, over time, we don't have time for questions. So we apologize, but we certainly will get back to you with answers. We promise you that. You'll get a copy of the deck um, after this, uh, in the days right after this webinar. We really appreciate you attending. Uh, thank you to Robin and Matt uh, and to the Cypher team that helped us produce this today. And hope you all have a lovely afternoon.